from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the following is provided by the West Virginia Department of Education and West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Hey! Hey everyone, it's Education Station! Hi, and welcome back to Education Station. I'm your host, Alex Milanese. Education Station is a show where we invite teachers from all across West Virginia to submit videos of themselves teaching their favorite lessons. In today's episode, we're getting three exciting lessons that you can try right at home. Now, before we hop into our first lesson, have you ever wondered why certain objects will sink when you put them in water, but others will rise back to the surface? Well, the reason is because of something called density. And for more on this topic, we're gonna go visit Mrs. Atkins. Hi everybody, Mrs. Atkins here. We're gonna do some experiments today to learn all about something called density. So to do this experiment, you're going to need the following items. You will need a container. I'm using a graduated cylinder here, but you could use an empty water bottle, a Gatorade bottle, even a glass will do fine. You also need some isopropyl alcohol, better known as rubbing alcohol, some oil like this vegetable oil, some dish soap, and finally some water, which I've added some red food coloring to just so we can see it a little better. We're going to take your container and then we're going to add our different substances to it. Remember we have oil, water, rubbing alcohol, and soap. Now, first of all, I'd like you to make a hypothesis. That means a prediction about what you think the outcome will be. When we mix these things together, do you think they will mix into one big weird looking liquid? Or do you think that they will remain separate and create layers in the container? Let's try it and see. I'm going to start with my dish soap. some bubbles. Next, I'll add my water and I'm going to do this slowly because I don't want to create a lot of bubbles. Next, I'm going to add the vegetable oil. And finally, I'll add the rubbing alcohol. So, was your hypothesis correct? You can see that the liquids we've added have remained separated into individual layers. We have the dish soap, the water, the vegetable oil, and the rubbing alcohol. Why do you think that they remain separated in layers like this? Well, the reason is because of something called density. We say that something is dense if its molecules are very tightly packed together. We say something is less dense when those molecules begin moving a little farther apart from each other. So in this container, which liquid do you think is most dense, meaning its molecules are tightly packed together? If you said the dish soap, then you'd be right. That's the reason that the dish soap is able to remain on the bottom without any of the other substances on top mixing in and getting in between those dish soap molecules. So which liquid then would be least dense? If you said the rubbing alcohol, you'd be right. The rubbing alcohol must be the least dense substance here because it's floating on top. So its molecules must be a little farther apart from each other than the molecules of the other substances below it. The more dense a substance is, the more likely it is to be on the bottom. And as we go up, the substances become less and less dense with our least dense floating on top. You can try this experiment at home with these same materials, or you could also try other liquids. Mix them together, let them settle, and see what happens. 
But wait, there's more. Did you know that temperature can affect the density of different substances? So I have another experiment we're going to try that shows how temperature affects the density of water. This next experiment is something that you probably shouldn't try at home. Just watch here. So I have two containers of water. This time I have warm water, which I've put red food coloring in, and I have cold water, which I've put blue food coloring in. I'm going to stack these two on top of each other. I'm going to try putting the cold on top of the warm, and then I'm going to try putting warm on top of cold. So I'm going to take my cold water first, cover it. This might get a little messy. I'm going to flip it, put it on top of the hot, and now I'm going to remove the card. Now I'd like you to make a hypothesis. What do you think is going to happen? Do you think that the colors will remain separate or do you think that they'll mix together? Let's find out. So it appears that the colors are definitely mixing together. The blue is definitely sinking down to the bottom, creating kind of a purple color. And it looks like maybe some of the red is trying to move up into the blue, but it's mixing together so fast it's hard to tell. Now let's try the other way. So now I have the cold water here, warm water here, and I'm going to try putting the hot water on top. Now, what do you think is going to happen? Will they mix or will they remain separated? Well, look at that. They remain separated. They are not mixing together. The hot water is remaining on top. The cold water is remaining on the bottom. So what's going on here? Why is the hot water able to stay on top and the cold water stay on the bottom? Well, remember, if something is more dense, that means that its molecules are more tightly packed together. If something is less dense, then its molecules are slightly farther apart from each other. When a substance is heated, like this water has been, that heat energy causes its molecules to speed up. And when those molecules speed up and start moving around, they also move slightly farther apart from each other. So when the water warms up, hot water is less dense than cool water. Cool water is more dense than hot water. So when we put the cold on top of the hot, that more dense cold water tried to sink to the bottom and that less dense hot water tried to rise to the top. So it mixed all together. But this time when the hot was already on top and the cold was on the bottom, the less dense hot water moved to the top. The more dense cold water remained at the bottom. Not a lot of mixing going on. So luckily, there is a way that you can try this for yourself at home without risking making a big mess. You'll still need some hot water colored with red food coloring and some cold water colored with blue food coloring. You'll also need a straw. A clear one works best so that way we can see the water inside. What we'll do is dip our straw first in the hot water, then the cold. Each time we'll cover the end of the straw with our thumb so it holds a little bit of water inside. So first I'll take a little bit of hot water and now I'll pick up a little bit of cold. And you can see that the red warm water or hot water remains on top while the cold water remains on the bottom without mixing very much. Why is this? Because of density. Remember that the cooler temperature water will be more dense. 
the hotter temperature water will have a lot of energy from the heat. So its molecules will be moving around and cause them to separate and move apart from each other a little bit more than the cool water. So the less dense hot water remains on top, the cooler, more dense water remains on the bottom. We're going to do the same thing, but this time we're going to try cold water, then hot. What do you think is going to happen? Let's give it a try. My straw, cold water, hot water. And you can see almost right away, it's mixing so fast that it didn't even look like there was any warm water. Let's try to get a little more. There's some. And again, mixing super fast. So why is this? Well, remember that warm water is less dense. So it's going to try to rise to the top. The blue water, the cold water, is more dense and it's going to try to sink to the bottom. So it's going to mix itself in that process. So I hope you've enjoyed doing these density experiments today and hopefully you'll be able to try some of them for yourself at home. Just be sure to check with the parent or guardian first and make sure that it's okay. Happy experimenting. Thanks, Mrs. Adkins. Okay, next up is Mrs. Pikarski, who has a fun way to integrate math into a classic card game. Let's check it out. Hey guys, this is Mrs. Pikarski. Um, today I'm going to show you guys a game that we can use to practice our addition and subtraction that we've been working on. Uh, what I'm using at home is I have Uno at my house. If you have Uno, you can use this to play this game or you can use the deck of cards that we sent you in your packets to play this game because what I've done is I've separated out all of the special Uno cards like wild and reverse and things like that. I'm not gonna use those for this game. So you can use this with any deck of cards. I'm just using my Uno cards because I have them at my house. Now, the only other thing you need to play this game is I just took a little sheet of paper and if you can see that, I just put a plus sign and a minus sign, right? So that's the only thing you need is a deck of cards and if you have paper and a pencil or a marker. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my deck of cards and separate them into two smaller decks. I'm gonna put them in front of me. And I'm gonna choose if I wanna do addition problems or subtraction problems. And you can mix them up, you can do both. Um, I'll show you an example of each problem. We'll do it together. Um, and then if you want to play this game at home with your parents or your grandparents or whoever, you can. So I'm going to start with addition. So I have my plus sign, right? Because that tells us we're joining two groups together. Okay. So I'm going to put my plus sign down on the table. I'm going to take the top card without looking, right? Because if we're looking ahead, then we're just picking out the numbers we want. And that's kind of cheating. So I'm going to take the first card off the top. And what is that number? I got a five. Okay, so I'm gonna put that down. And then for my second deck, oh, I got another five, okay? So my problem, and I'm gonna hold this up so you can see it the best I can. Okay, I got five plus five. Okay, so I want you to think at home, um, use our different ways we can figure it out. You can use your fingers, you can draw pictures, right? You can count on, right? Start at five and count five more. I'm gonna use my hands to figure this out. I have five plus five. So I'm gonna count five on one hand, five on the other and see what my answer is. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so I have five plus five. What would my answer be? 10, right? Five plus five equals 10. All right. So what you can do is you can just keep going and just keep flipping over the next card, putting it on top um, and just keep doing addition problems. I'm going to do a subtraction problem now to show you. Okay. So my next number, I'm going to show you again. What did I get? I got another five. Okay. So now I have five and what do we call this sign? Our minus signs so I have five minus Ooh, okay now I'm going to show you what happened actually um, I got a number what is this number right see if you can see that I got a nine now can I take nine away from five 
No, I can't because nine is greater than five. So I'm gonna put that off to the side. So if that happens to you when you're doing subtraction problems, you get a number that's bigger than the number you started with, you can't take that away. So you have to keep going. So I'm gonna go ahead and keep going until I get a number that's smaller than five, that's less than five. Okay, so I got one. What is my number? Four, right? We talked about sometimes people write fours this way. Um, so I got five minus or take away four. Let me make sure I'm holding this so you guys can see it correctly. Okay, either way, I'm taking away four from five, okay? So let's figure this out. Five, and I need to take away four. So I'm gonna count as I take away four. So I'm gonna count minus one, two, three, four. Okay, so how many does that leave? Only my pinky finger, right? So five minus four equals one. So that's one way we can figure it out. If you have paper and pencil at home and you wanna draw pictures to figure it out, that's another way. Um, and like I said, you can just keep uh, changing between the two signs if you want to practice that way. Um, this is just a quick little game that you can play uh, to practice our addition subtraction if you want with your deck of cards at home. So I hope that you guys enjoyed this. Um, I sure had fun playing this game. And I hope that you guys are doing well at home. Um, let me know if you have any other kind of games that you want to learn about, right? So these are some addition and subtraction games. Um, if there's any other stuff that you want to learn about, let me know and I'll try to make a video for you guys. I really miss you and I hope you're all doing well. Have a good day. Bye. Thanks, Mrs. Pikarski. Who knew math could be so much fun? Well, speaking of math and fun, our next teacher, Mr. Grant, has an awesome way to combine math with physical education. Let's check it out. Hello, West Virginia students. Thanks for tuning in. And thanks for allowing me to bring learning to you. My name's Josh Grant, the physical education coordinator for the West Virginia Department of Education. And I'm excited to bring fitness from my living room to yours. We're not only gonna be bringing fitness today, we're gonna be learning math. Wait a second, did he say math? I sure did. With our school closure, we're missing valuable instruction. So what a great opportunity to take two academic concepts like physical education and math and put them together. Research shows us that healthy, active students make better learners. And doesn't it just make sense to involve ourselves in a mathematic concept so we understand it a little better? I think so. And hopefully by the end of this video, you'll think so too. The math concept we're working on today is a sixth grade math standard. Now, if you're not in sixth grade yet, don't worry. We can bring the math down to you. It's utilizing basic addition, subtraction, division properties to find what we call the mean, median, and the mode of a data set of numbers. Hopefully you've already had this taught to you if you are in sixth grade, but the mean of a data set of numbers, it would be the average of a data set of numbers. Taking the numbers in a data set, adding them together, and dividing them by how many numbers are in that data set, that is how you find the mean of a data set. The median of a data set is taking the numbers, placing them numerically from highest to lowest and finding the number that lands in the middle. That would be the median of a data set. The mode in a data set is the number that occurs most often in a data set. Some data sets won't have a mode and that's okay. The fitness or physical education component we're working on today is the push-up. The push-up is one of the best upper body exercises you can do. It requires no equipment and it activates so many of the upper body muscles uh, for upper body strengthening. The upper body muscles that activates are your pectoral muscles, your deltoid muscles on your shoulders, and your tricep muscles. Those are the primary muscles that activates. It does activate a few more. What a great exercise. Now, if you can't do a push up yet, don't worry and don't be scared. I have a modification that you can do. I'm gonna show you right now or demonstrate the proper way to perform a 90 degree angle push-up. When doing the push-up, you go on the balls of your feet, arms shoulder width apart, back straight. As you go down, your back is straight, a 90 degree angle, and you come up. That is a push-up. If you wanna see that from the front, back straight, balls of your feet, go down and up. That is a push-up. Now, if you cannot do a push-up yet, this is a modified push-up. A modified push-up is simply going on the knees, going to your knees, back straight, 
Elbows locked, going down and up. That's a little easier and a great way to practice if you can't do a push-up yet. Planks are an also great way to practice too. Plank is simply going up and holding yourself in that position. All those required because if you can't do a push-up yet, you can't do a push-up, but that's okay. You can practice so you'll be able to. Now, in this activity, all you need is to get an open spot. This would be a great opportunity to get one of your parents or someone in your room to help count your push-ups. Get them up and let them be active too. You're gonna need a counter. If you don't have a counter, you can use yourself. I'm gonna be by myself and that's okay. I have to keep track then of my own push-ups. I have a marker and a pen or a paper to write something down. That's fine too. I also, um, you're gonna need a stopwatch to keep time. Don't worry about that. If I can keep time for you if you're doing this along with me. And then I brought some music because I like to work out to music because it just helps motivate me. If you don't like to work out to music, that's okay. Or you pick the music you like, I'll pick the music I like. So um, you're gonna get into your open space, just area that you can do a push-up in. You have your partner keep track of the number of push-ups you do. You're gonna go on my cue. Get in position. Ready? Set? Go! How many push-ups did you do? If you did more than me, great. If you did less than me, that's okay. It's not about how many push-ups I did, it's about how many you did. Now, we're gonna need some more push-ups in our data set. We're gonna need some more numbers to make a whole data set of numbers. At this point, you're gonna either have to find some members in your house that are uh, available and say, hey, could you help me out and try to help me out to find out what the mean, median mode's about in math? I need you to perform 30 seconds of push-ups and I'll count them for you. Or if you're alone like me, you then simply text your friends and say, hey, could you do me a favor? Can you do as many push-ups as you can in 30 seconds and then text me your number so I can get a data set? It's that simple. To save time, I already did that. And I texted five of my friends to ask them to perform the push-up challenge. They all complied and their text went back. Um, I'll show you here on this board, their text back. I texted my friend Mark, Robin, Erica, Joey, and Dustin. My friend Mark did 35. My friend Robin did 25. My friend Erica did 18. My friend Dustin did 30. And my friend Joey did 20. When I added those numbers together, I got 158. 158 push-ups. That was awesome. I had a nice strong group of friends. Then what I decided to do is now I wanted to find the mean of the data set. Finding the mean of the data set, remember, is taking the amount of numbers in the data set and dividing, adding them up and then dividing by how many numbers. I had six friends and it went into 158 push-ups. So I took 158 divided by six, um, my simple long division here, my six into 15, Six and the one doesn't go, but my six and the 15 went two times because that made 12 with three left over. Then I brought my eight down because six doesn't go into three. My eight down, six in goes into 38. Six times, th six into 38 goes six times. Six times six is 36 with two left over. I had to put my decimal point there. Six doesn't go into two, but 2.0. Six into 20 goes three times. Six, in, six times three is 18 with the three repeated. So here my mean is 26.3 would be my average or my mean. Working on now to my mode, I added the I put the numbers from highest to lowest here. My 35 was my highest, then my 30, 30, 25, 20, and 18. I counted up one, two, three, four, five, six numbers. 
I tried to find the third number in the set. One, two, three. One, two, three. There's not an exact third number. So I had to then, when you don't have an exact third number to find the median, you have to take the two numbers that are in that spot and then add them together and divide. So I had a 25 and a 30. I had to take my 30 plus 25 equals 55. Then I had to divide that by the two numbers. 55 divided by two equals 27.5. That's my median. On to finding my mode to see if there's a mode exists in my data set. I had a 30, a 35, a 25, an 18, a 20, and a 30. I did notice two 30s because myself and my friend Dustin both had 30s. So then the mode of my data set would be a 30. I hope you had a great time today getting a little stronger and learning about the mean, median, and mode. If you're not in sixth grade yet, you can simply find out how many push-ups, how many more push-ups did Mark do than Josh. So in that situation, I would take the 35, I would subtract and then subtract 30, and then I would wind up with five. And you could understand the math from there to bring the math down, to make it a symbol. Or how many more did Josh do than Erica? And you could find that out too. I'm really excited you joined me today, and I am so thankful that you decided to take this opportunity to get a little stronger. Are your arms sore yet? I hope, I bet they are. If not, good for you. Well, till next time, this is Josh Grant saying, stay half healthy and get active. Thanks, Mr. Grant. All right, well, that wraps up everything for us here today on Education Station. We want to thank all the teachers who submitted their awesome lessons, and we want to thank you for watching. We'll see you next time right here on Education Station. Thank you.